slow to get over here. <laughs> uh, last night, I, how do I, uh, remind me how I move things? Arrow. arrow, okay. I thought about wanting to reframe this discussion um, uh, sort of like, uh, in retitling it actually, um, the new American apartheid, uh, getting rid of, equalizing health care won't get rid of the new American apartheid. And my discussion actually flows through this. Uh, I'm going to talk stories, I'm going to give some numbers, and I'm going to frame it. And I'm feeling very emotional. <laughs> um, Largely because I'm a direct benefit, all my criticism of Title VI comes from a person who directly benefited from it. Uh, I was 16 years old when uh, Title VI was passed. Um, and my whole family history changed because of it. My father, who, got college, who re graduated from Jarvis Christian College in 1949, the year after I was born, who never held a white job until the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, and except for the Civil Rights Act for 1964, would have never had a white job. That's what we called them. <laughs> there were jobs to be had, but the jobs my dad uh, 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 drove taxi, college educated. And I hate it when I hear people say black people don't appreciate education. I said, shit, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Black people were getting education when they knew that there was nothing they could do with it. Both my parents graduated from a college knowing, living in the South, that they had very little choices that they were going to be able to make with that degree. But my family nevertheless went to school, and that is true today. The kids have not changed. They go to school, they get an education, knowing that as compared to white people in this society, they will not have the same opportunities. But they do it anyway. So don't criticize the young people for uh, what they're doing in education. I want to talk about the legal system as a structure for change in health uh, because there's only two ways we change this society, money and law. If you don't have the money, you better have the law because otherwise you're digging, you're spitting in the wind you, in, in your efforts. Everything in this society functions under the law. The law authorizes limits and authorizes behavior. We have racial inequalities because the law says that that is an acceptable thing. You can work on changing values all you want, but until the law says that's unacceptable, you are working against. People will, we are, we, we like to say that we are, we are a nation who believes in, uh, of, uh, in changing, making, solving disputes by the law. So when the law is quiet on something, you must realize that the law is authorizing it. When the law is quiet on something, the law is authorizing it. That's the only way you can look at it. You can't say, well, uh, and you have to look at, well, how long has it been authorizing it? Why won't, hasn't it changed? There is a reason the law functions the way it does. And I'm going to go past this because I don't have time. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that when I talk about the law, I'm not talking about just statutes and cases. I'm also talking about regulations because they have the force of law. And obviously, state and federal constitutions it is my belief that anti-discrimination law today is institutional discrimination. Title VI, which I benefited from, I was the first and the only black in every job I had in my lifetime. And you do not understand the stress of being in a historically white institution all your life. 
But I am thankful to Title VI for that opportunity. But Title VI no longer can solve the problems we have. And if until we admit that, we will continue to have inequities in our society. And this is a, when I talk, I'm not going to get into this, but this is a framework that you can think about in terms of in, uh, how historical and current deprivations and oppression leads to embedded racial inequality, then leads to communities having no choice. Dayton, Ohio has 75,000 people within the city limits and one grocery store. One grocery store. But they have every food, fast food chain you can think of. Every fast food chain you can think of. But they can't put grocery stores. Of course, Dollar General's taking over that space. So you can get all the processed foods you want on every corner because Dollar General is serving cheap processed food within, which is within a half a mile of it. In, in Dayton, you can, within a half a mile of wherever you are in that city, there's a Dollar General. But Dollar General doesn't have fresh foods. Dollar, Dollar General doesn't have fresh meats. Dollar General just has processed foods. What did I do? Okay, I'm going to get control of my emotions. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Most racial inequalities is due to institutional discrimination. That, so when we talk, that's the only way I can look at that. And the law, this is an example. I said we were talking last night, we were talking about income and tax, and I love tax law. I, always, I never got around to teaching it because I think tax law is an amazing example of the value system of an American society. There is no way to understand the tax code except through the value that it represents. Once you start saying, why do businessmen get to deduct all of their lunches, and why do you do not get to deduct your child care, you begin to say, hmm, what do we value? Okay, and so wealth and income, the tax code, predatory lending, pre -day, uh, payday lending, subprime mortgages, all these things that went fairly unregulated and dis disproportionately impacting black communities is because of the values. So I want to say that anti-discrimination law is inadequate. And I'm, I'm going to go, I'm just going to briefly say that the Patient Protection Act, notwithstanding my friend Sydney's uh, glowing overrepresentation of what it will do. The, pay, the section 1157 is little different from Title VI on its face. I think there are plenty of people who are hoping that when it gets to court, it will be interpreted in a way that allows all the things she says. But on its face, it doesn't allow that. And I don't have the luxury of thinking that a conservative white mostly white court is going to suddenly say, oh, we've spent uh, years interpreting Title VI in a way that limits race, and then now we're going to get to this new law, and even though the new law says interpret and connects it to Title VI, we're suddenly going to ignore all of the language of Title VI. So I don't think Patient Protection Act provides anything new. Uh, so, when I think about distinguishing stereotypes, biases, and prejudices, we have to look at the colorblind races who thinks they have no stereotype, biases, and prejudices, but discriminate. And that's most of the institutional racism. And I wanted to get to this in terms of saying, I taught criminal law and tort law and discrimination law, and one of the, these areas are all areas where injuries occur. There are areas of law that are intended to protect people from injuries. Why then does criminal law and tort law allow uh, 
litigation from everything from intentional conduct to we don't care what your state of mind was. If you do X, you're responsible, period. But discrimination law is limited to a very narrow intentional definition. My answer is because in criminal law and tort law, the people who make the law saw themselves as potential victims. And they wanted to make sure that they and their families as victims would get into court. But in discrimination law, they saw themselves as potential victims of being unjustly accused. And so they wanted to limit the entry to court. So what do I recommend then? How much time I got? Yeah. What? We have five minutes. Oh, good. I'm, OK, thank you. Uh, we, we need to disavow Title VI and realize that no matter how good it was, it is not effective, cannot be made effective. Just like we've had several Civil Rights Act, it is time for a new Civil Rights Act. Title VI, blessed soul, needs to be laid to rest. And we need to have a law, a law that recognizes multiple forms of discrimination, intentional, reckless, and negligent. We need to authorize medical testers uh, and testers of other uh, systems. We need to allow for individual and organizational right of action. That is one of the biggest problems into getting into court is the fact that there has to be an individual who has identified themselves as being discriminated against and injured. Why can't we authorize civil rights organizations to go into court to be private attorney generals to enforce the law against institutions? Why do they have to seek out an individual when they got the data, why can't they just go into court? You know, and so we need to authorize that. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest of this because it'll be in my article. Uh, I want to kind. I, we need punitive damages. Don't let anybody tell you punitive damage is unfair. The only way organizations and institutional changes their behavior is when it costs them more in court than what they can predict. And they can predict non-punitive damages. And that's how come they, they, they're quite happy to pay fines and settle, because it's all very predictable. But punitive damages, not so much. OK, I want to kind of end with this. I, I put the, <laughs> my great grandfather was a slave, Vanless Randall, in Texas. And his wife, Narcissus, died from lack of health care during slavery. My grandfather, born right after slavery, and my grandmother, my grandmother died in, when my dad was 11 years old from lack of health care. My family lived through Jim Crow. I lived through Jim Crow. I went to two room schools. <coughs> I picked cotton. I used the bathroom on the side of the road because you couldn't stop at the toilets. When we traveled, we packed food because we knew there wasn't restaurants we could go to. My school didn't integrate until the year after I graduated from high school. My mother, my mother died in 1957 on a black woman's ward in the Philadelphia hospital. My dad almost got killed by a white man who stuck a gun in his face because my dad, drunk, called his wife, honey, the white woman. My uncle, I was in the car, and my uncle pleaded, don't kill him. They just lost their mother. And what makes me really sad is not that history. But the realization 
that a new system of oppression has formed for my grandkids, where people can walk up with guns and shoot them, where they can be put into jail because they're walking while black, because there's all kind of legal oppressions that go with that felony conviction, because there are inequities that can only be called the new American apartheid. And so I'm leaving you with this. The problem is that there is a new system of oppression around race. And if you work on only one part, health care, that would be like working on better health care for the slaves. That would be like working on better health care for people doing Jim Crow. Very good idea. And yes, you're going to help some people. But if you don't dismantle the system, all you're doing is enabling it. Thank you. You guys can take a moment to gather yourselves, but if anybody has questions, this is the time and the opportunity to ask our panelists anything. I see you in the back. Do I need this mic? Yes, uh, it seems that we're at a paradox in terms of intervention. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, patient relationships with uh, physicians yesterday. Uh, we've talked about dismantling the system. Uh, and then we've talked about uh, the issues around uh, Title VI and, uh, and intervention within that. Uh, what is actually uh, uh, going to take place? As, as uh, uh, Ms. Randall indicated, that, there, uh, that it seems that we have reinvented or reimagining of some form of uh, uh, Jim Crow. So uh, my question is uh, relevant to the uh, issues around uh, the inequities in medical. And what uh, are we it, it, are we operating again in a band-aid approach, or are or are these inequities are inevitable? And uh, and uh, what is and I also find that within the um, arena of law, school, that m there's an issue around careerism. A young uh, uh, public interest uh, advocate from St. Louis yesterday indicated that when she was a young lawyer, that she uh, her her ability was to want to litigate against uh, these issues. It appears that today, when I interact or interface with law students, that it's more about uh, other uh, forms of career, not litigating it within the public interest sphere. Could you answer those two questions in terms of? Uh, replication of uh, a new apartheid and uh, the the tandem of uh, the law student or uh, within the uh, within the activist community or activist law student I teach uh, race and racism in American law and one of the things that I learn from all these years of teaching is that systems of oppression happens one law at a time. And when pe that at some point people wake up and realize that the system of oppression is there. Slavery didn't start by a law that put all black people into slavery. It started by uh, extending the indentured uh, servants' contracts who broke a law and then, then they made laws that uh, made children have the status of the women of the birth of their mothers and it's just one law on top of one law on top of another law. Jim Crow was the same way. Jim Crow, there were, the Jim Crow was uh, layered laws fairly quickly and what and I guess what makes me feel so bad is is that I was of the generation if you look at my chart I don't know if it's still up but 
if you look at the chart, I benefited from, I went through sort of a reconstruction period after Jim Crow yeah, and benefited from that. But during, almost from 1980 on, there has been law after law passed to, to put in a system, a new system of oppression. And people, and so yes, I'm, I'm rambling. Yes, I think we have, uh, we have a done deal this is, uh, you, you cannot think as, oh, okay, we've got time to change it. No, you, you have a system of, we have a system of oppression in place, and they're just making it worse now. And I think that the only way, short of revolution, which would be a good way, uh, and I'm not kidding, uh, I think that, uh, that short of a law that really makes all forms of racial discrimination illegal so that individual people will again begin, because people don't like to be sued. And so if they have to be become legally responsible for racial inequities caused by unintentional conduct, they will start putting in place systems of monitoring so that they will know. Right now, the, someone said, lawyers have taught people how to get around the Title VI. And how to get around it is just have some other reason for your behavior that you can articulate and people will let you do it. If we move to a system where the discrimination itself is unacceptable, period, regardless of your other reason, then people will begin to pay attention and stop discriminating. Uh, they'll find other ways to make money. Uh, the second question. Uh, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, sir. We only have time for one more question, so if I could pass, if anybody else has another one, if not, we'll come back to you. But does anyone else have another question? I see a hand here right behind you. Hi, um, Michelle Van Ryan. And first, I want to say this fabulous panel, really inspiring, all the talks, um, so thank you for that. Uh, what you just said about implicit, that if people are responsible and if institutions are responsible for the impact of implicit bias, then action will be taken, I just, I resonate to that, I do. And when I, when I try to talk about it, so I work within a system in a hearts and mind way, right? So, and I was talking to my colleague Kristen here about being inside a medical care system and trying to hearts and minds people into change. And I keep waiting for the negligent laws, right? Where's the negligence laws? We know it's happening. We know it's creating tremendous morbidity and mortality. And what I keep coming against is f show me the individual who can sue. So I was so excited as a healthcare person to get invited to this because I was like, okay, because it, from this hearts and minds thing, it's not working out real well. Right. So sometimes what I do, and I have a, a, a question for you, uh, I know this is too much, and that is, you know, how can we make sure that this No. No. I think the fact of the matter is over the last 50 years, I've seen study after study after study reported in the news, and every time it gets reported, white people go, oh my God, I can't believe that's happening. No, I'm saying it was happening to white people. If, the white, if, if there was unintentional bias against white people. Yeah, but the problem is, is the systems are not run I mean, I mean, I think that if you, if I, I, I don't think an implicit, I don't think that implicit bias is the sole thing of white people. Okay, no, obviously, black people have implicit bias. Forty percent of black people don't like black people. Okay, but black people don't run systems, and so if you're talking about the systems in which all this is occurring, we have to talk about white people. I mean. It, it, yeah, implicit, and so the problem is, is 
I think if you could show that white people were being implicitly biased against by white people, it'd probably be resignated, but I'm not sure how you would show that when white people are benefiting from implicit bias, not being disadvantaged by it. See, I'm, I'm talking about the will, the will to make with the, with the power structures. I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that. Yeah, I understand. And I think the will to make the change, this is why I'm, I'm all for the law. I was a nurse for 20 years before I went into law school, and I believe in law changing behavior because I believe people obey stupid laws. And, and, and they obey them without thinking about it. And because we are a people who like to obey the law, we will obey laws that we disagree with. So it seems to me that the will to change will come from a law that says you can't do that. They'll be pissed, but they will implement ways to make sure that it's not happening. And how do you create that law? Can I That's a good point. Can I, yeah. can I just say that I do not see um, the environment in which there is going to be fundamental legal change. I don't see it coming from the federal courts. I think there are very few states that in fact have judiciary uh, that will uh, experiment with progressive solutions. I do not see it coming from, I, I think that our politics right now is so frozen because of money. I just don't see, except for local change, um, some at the state level and some it, with municipalities, I do not see that we have any possibility, either using the courts or um, Congress, to get any kind of laws passed that would make this possible. I mean, perhaps that will change in decades to come, but right now, I do not see that we have a po political climate in which any of this is even discussable much less able to come to a vote. All right, and that's where we will begin. <laughs>